Hi, welcome to the Stitch TV show. I'm Lynn. And I'm Pam. We're happy you're joining us today. The Stitch is an online quilt talk show, the perfect soundtrack for your sewing room. In addition to our talk shows, we also post tutorial videos, virtual stitch-ins, and even online quilt classes. You can learn more at thestitchtvshow.com. Today we're going to be talking about the most versatile block sizes and some organizing tips to help you quilt faster. We're joined by Pam's version of Bonnie Hunter's Alia Terry. Alia Terry. I'm so glad you said that because I was like, hey, well, uh, quilt. <laughs> the Alia Terry quilt. Our show today is brought to you by our friends at QT Fabrics, and you can learn more about them in the link in the show notes. So this is the first time we have this particular fabric on the table. We're both and, drooling And a I little. just assumed like, oh, it's a stack of fabrics. And then I realized, no, this is the Mingle fabric line where... A yard of fabric is printed as four fat quarters. I love it. Which they can do because of digital printing. Right. <laughs> so we're actually going to have, sometime soon, a little interview with Ken, the president of QT, about digital printing and all the different things that you can do with that, different from traditional screen printing. But, um, yeah, I pulled out the kit, and then I was like, huh. Lynn started flipping through it. I'm like, oh, it's that fabric where you print the four fat quarters on it. Uh, yeah, and then I started going... Because the only other, well, there's, I'm sure, other fabrics that are printed similar to this, but uh, Jen Kingwell did, you know, blocks of stuff in some of her lines. Mm -hmm. um, but they were very, they weren't big, as big a chunks as this is. Yeah. So I think this is really kind of cool. And for one yard of fabric, you get. I mean, four fat four quarters. Because that's quarters. how math works out. But if you think about it, though. Really, this is a better value because if you buy fat quarters by themselves, they add up, four of them add up more to than a yard of fabric does. So yeah. this is kind of, you know, you get four different looks. Same color, too. So we just decided that, like, maybe this green, because we don't see a lot of good primary green. I love that um, green. But to, to get four of that same kind of green can be very helpful in one yard. Oh, I think so, too. And just, I, they're nice pretty bright. They're going to go with a lot of stuff. Yeah. Really well, like so them. the intention is that um, they're going to go into this quilt. <laughs> yes. Because QT um, sent us this kit for the table, and then I thought, well, I actually want to make this quilt. Right. And uh, there may be a tutorial video or something in it, too. That sounds good, yeah. So we'll it's see. But cute. it's cute. This is a kit that they sell to quilt shops. You'll have to ask your local quilt shop if and they And honestly, it. just looking at it, what, if you are just starting quilting, and I know we have some beginner quilts, what a great kit. Yeah. Perfect. One is, I, I mean, I don't know what their price point is, but I'm sure it's not a huge investment for this many different fabrics. Looks, even though it's only... Yeah, it's nine different fabrics. Yeah, but you get four in each one. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's a essentially a version of real fence. Yeah, very just... So not... great beginner quilt, and wow, it's just got a neat impact, too. I like the way it looks. So, in an ideal world, I will get it finished, and it will hang behind us in a show or two from now. <laughs> Knowing Pam, she will because she has process tips on how to quilt. Right, that's the second half of the show. She so have to stay tuned for those. <laughs> All right. All righty. So, best quilt block sizes. Okay. What does best mean? Well, best for what? Best to fit my cat's butt when they right, sit on it? Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. What does that mean? <laughs> well, I was thinking, you know, there are certain go to quilt block sizes that can be mingled into other, because, I don't know. But because math. Because math. And because um, you always have leftover blocks sometimes. You make too many. Do you make too many? No. That's not true. She does. No. She's typically made too many. When I went, get... Oh, no, I have a queen size quilt. I thought I'd have a left. No. Typically what happens, like when I'm following a pattern that like someone else has written, they're like, oh, you cut this and this, and you're going to have, like, this many left over because you need, like, a weird n amount. Right. And then I have, like, three flying geese left. And I'm like... Those can't be there. That bugs you. Yeah. It now, totally bugs you. A person that loved to piece labels into the back of their quilt would, like, just put the flying geese next to the label. But I tend to just kind of piece my backs and then attach a label, like, on top of it after it's quilted. I do, too. Yeah. Anyway. So, 
uh, but it's rare that I have orphan blocks. Usually it's from stuff that we're doing, like color lectures and all that. So I don't have a lot of leftover blocks. I have tons of orphan blocks. I put them into quilts and use them. Yeah, I so built two whole quilts around four leftover blocks. <laughs> I showed them at Guild. You missed it because you weren't uh, there. I know. <laughs> but I put them on my personal okay. Instagram. <laughs> so, but what, I'm gonna, what my point is, if you're following somebody else's pattern... They're going to tell you what size blocks you're making. Right. So you're kind of stuck there. But if you're designing for yourself or you want to make a quilt for someone and you're doing it the whole design from scratch, there are some go-to block sizes that work well with other block sizes. Mm-hmm. Right? And we kind of talked about this a little bit last episode when we were talking about Um, unit sizes of the blocks. So, like, I think my one of my major go-to block sizes is a 9-inch and a 12-inch block because these break down into 3-inch units. Or 4-inch, depending on the style of 12-inch block. Right, or 4-inch units out. Yeah, so this is 4-inch units are really 2. 3-inch units. If it were a friendship star, it would be four inch units. Because you got four units times three equals 12. But if you had this block, oh, that's but nine. in 12 yeah, inch. Yeah, she's right. This way. <laughs> yes. Math. I'm, I'm tired this morning. <laughs> we're um, both tired. A yeah. little, little bit of chaos. It snowed oh, yesterday in Georgia. It was, yeah, it was crazy. A little bit of drama. <laughs> it was. <laughs> It was a weird day yesterday. It was totally a weird day yesterday. So, but these break down into... Three-inch units. Three-inch units. So, what what I think is nice about this is say, okay, I have eight of these blocks. I need to make a quilt, but I need more blocks that go with this. I think it's really easy to do Mm four-patch or a... A nine patch in three inches because you can do an inch, which I think are cute. I like little piecing, and you know this. It drives you a little crazy. She likes big pieces. Um, but if I did a uh, nine patch unit, nine patch unit, nine patch unit, you on, can just have like a connector Irish chain block to right set those in off. between and set those off. So nine inch blocks are really easy to use with other blocks that are divisible by three. Yes. So I go for nine, 12. Um, those are probably in six. She slipped in a couple sixes here lately because you've been doing most, a lot of like table runners or smaller wall mm-hmm. hangings. Yeah. Now to which make like just, a queen which size you quilt just out of shrink. six. Inch, oh, that's a ooh, lot of work. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of seams. <laughs> and that's what makes big quilts heavy when you have all small oh, pieces yeah. on big quilts mean heavier. Right. It is true. That is true. Lots of seam allowance. But if you've got a 12-inch, yeah. now this is finished, 12-inch finished. It's unfinished 12 and a half. But if you've got a 12-inch finished block, shrinking this down to half is easy to do. Mm-hmm. Um, math-wise, if you're wanting to do, like, you could do I don't know. 12 around it, six inch blocks, it, and then it gets bigger and it's cute. The bigger your block size, the less blocks you need to make a quilt. True. <laughs> That's why 12 inch blocks scale well for larger quilts. They but do. Then, as you start looking at like lap and baby, like a nine inch size works well. Right. And then on down to a wall hanging or table runner, like a six inch works well. Now, I'm going to throw a block size in there. I've been using it a lot lately, and I think I like it because of how I can get different things to work. But a 10-inch block I like because I like dealing with smaller pieces, and it has, you can divide those by two or five, and I like it because it gives you a center, like you could do a center point here. And I really enjoy blocks that connect to other blocks, and that works well with a something in the middle. And by connect, you mean kind of like extend that pattern when they're right. butted up next to each right. other. Like this pattern is extended from another block that comes in. It's got two half-square triangles on another block that would make that point. Mm-hmm. 
So I like 10 inch blocks because you can do that also with them. Um, but I, when I'm designing, I'm always looking at what they're butting up against and can I do smaller sizes easy? Because there are certain things you do not want to figure out how to cut. Mm -hmm. Just because it's hard. Yeah, unless you have like a specialty template or... Right. I think a lot of Deb Tucker's rulers work well in that case because she's got multiple sizes for the right. same unit built in there. Um, Marty Michelle has a Marty new Michelle, thing coming which, out. Marty Michelle, which... The nine patch parade. We're going to be a part of. Yep. And she really makes nine patches easier for... Like you could make... So she's got this new template ruler set. Template set, I think, is what you would call it. And and so you don't have to do the math to figure out, like, well, I need a five-inch finish nine patch. Right. And that's not easy math. That's like some crazy math with, right. like, a repeating three. <laughs> Something with seven eighths. I don't know. <laughs> so, but she's got a template set coming out for that uh, intentionally. So. It may already be out with this. Yeah, good point. Yeah, I think. I think so. Yeah. At least available for pre-order somewhere. Yeah. We'll link it. Because we saw it at Market last fall. So shops know about it and hopefully right. getting it in stock. Right. So, but what, are there any sizes that you're just like, no? I tend to gravitate towards the 9 and the 12. Yeah. Um, and lots of what I do, honestly, because I'm working with. You do pre-cuts <sighs> the Bonnie Hunter. Uh, no, that's not where I was going with it. Oh, I was okay. thinking through how I cut my scraps. Because mm -hmm. I cut my scraps down into like consistent sizes. So I have a whole bunch of five inch squares in my stash and I have a whole bunch of three and a half inch and two inch. And we talked about this like way back in season one, like years ago, I think. Uh, and one of our more popular episodes about like best like scrap cutting or something. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so you can make a four patch out of the two inch squares and you get a three and a half inch square. Cool. So three and a half works into <coughs> nine and 12 right. size blocks, that unit. What I tend to do is like there's a fabric in my stash that's just like sticking out to me of like, oh, this fabric like wants to be made into something. Like that one time I had that ugly fabric. It was like that weird mountain that was green and there was purple sky. It was real bizarre. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to cut this up. And so now I know I need to find scraps to work with it that are like this lavender, this purple, this, you know, Whatever. And then, you know, a light and a dark value to kind of set everything off. And so I went through my scraps and I know, like, if I'm targeting a nine inch block, I can do a four patch made out of five inch squares, or I could do a nine patch made out of three inch squares. And they both come out to like nine inch finished. Yeah. And so I tend to just like go through my scraps and pull out all the squares and the colors that I'm looking for. And then I just start laying them out of like, oh, this would make a good nine patch with these nine things and, and start laying them out that way. So you tend to do nine inch squares. In that way. But I'm not necessarily making like star blocks and all that out of it. It's a lot of real basic, just kind of like setting units. And so, then occasionally there's a star block that's left over or something that I'll throw right, in there. for some. Right. Or if I've got a print that I want to use, I will cut like a nine and a half inch square out of this print. And then that kind of is just a big, nice block of fabric so you can show off what the print is without it being too cut up. Okay, I do have another example that was a specific block to a specific, and it was for a layered cake to do this block. Mm -hmm. The math was stupid when I had to figure it out because um, you were cutting one and seven eighths and, you know, just un not one and a half or one and a fourth or whatever. And it ends up being a seven inch finished block. Now, I liked the quilt when it was done, and this is a leftover block from it because it didn't use all the um, layer cake that I was doing for it. But it's seven inches. It doesn't even finish exactly seven inches, it's like six and three quarter inches. So, we can do that. <laughs> Don't, yeah. So, this one, that, that's why I'm saying, is there a go to size? And seven is not it. Seven inch blocks, are, I think, are tough or weird. Seven what, inch blocks. What you could do. Okay. <coughs> get a, a piece of fabric that works with that, cut it in the same size, draw a diagonal line, stitch quarter inch on either side, and then you got like two escrow triangles. Oh, that's that kind of probably cute. finish at six, I think. 
Oh, I'd like that. Close to six inch finished if you cut this and turn it And I have a few of these. Well, there you go. So this may turn up in something. You're welcome. Because I've been going through. <laughs> now, part of my kind of. Or alternately, just like, boop, just trim off and use these corners. Yeah, those corners are cute, aren't they? Yeah. It is a cute block. It's cute. It's cute. I think I like it because it's got that big center, and yeah. most of the times you see them more even. Yeah. And I liked it because it wasn't even. So that's what I like. But that's about the that trade-off. It is the trade-off. Sizes. And you have weird sizes. And I think this is a weird size, too. I think I measured it, and it wasn't 10, and it wasn't, and it was just a specific. But it's let also me from just, your first quilt. It also is from my first quilt. <laughs> and, ever. And l- Look ever. at that seam allowance. Look at that seam allowance, Amazing. baby. <laughs> It is uh, half an inch, three quarters of an inch. Oh, Who knows? I I told you what happened. Oh, yeah. You did. You sewed it on different machines. I sewed it on different machines, and I was just going by whatever line was on that machine because I thought yeah. that's what you followed. And Nope. And the answer is no. So, yeah, check out that scene. So, this was probably supposed to be 12 or something or 10, but mm-hmm. it didn't. This was... Um, it had aspirations. What's her name? Eleanor Burns. Eleanor Burns. She always threw it over her shoulder. Do you yes. remember that? Yes. Not everybody would. Go look up Eleanor Burns and she'll be demonstrating something. She'll go, just get rid of this. And she'll throw it over her shoulder. Which is great until the cat's walking by. Uh, and then it's like, what? And then it's like, game on. It's raining fabric. Oh, so last night, because of the snow, um, Josie was very, my dog, Josie was very like, I've been inside all day. <laughs> so she had more energy than normal. Drove me a little Clark crazy. She did the chase tail thing, chase tail thing. Then she barked at us like we were doing something wrong. We were watching TV. <laughs> yes. Anyway. Our dog was similar. So, but he's much more, like, cool with just, you know, Netflix and chilling all day. Just like, oh, just they normally are, the too. Like, uh. But they get some outside time. And, like, she apparently, well, they don't like snow. True. My dogs do not like snow. Like, it's not a yeah. cool thing. Fred is not a fan. He wouldn't go out, like, through the main doors. We'd, like, take him out through the basement so he could go under the porch where there was no snow to do his business. Yeah. And then my husband took him out in the evening. Because we usually go out for, like, a big walk at a nearby park in the evening. <laughs> and, like, it's cold and dark and muddy. <laughs> my husband took him. <laughs> Didn't last long. Yeah. It was quick. <laughs> they were back very quick. It's Well, it was it was colder. It's not as cold as other parts of the world. We totally understand for that. For us. But for us, it was cold. <laughs> and we moved down south to not have to deal with this. Yes, we did. The best part about Georgia snow is 3 o'clock, it's melted. You get it in the morning. You go, oh, my gosh, look how pretty this is. 3 o'clock, you're like, hey, let's go grab. We need to go to Sam's. <laughs> That's what we did yesterday. We had to go to Sam's. So, all right. So that was just some ideas or I thought yes. just which one, when you're designing for yourself, think about what it's going to go with and how easy you can break down those units mathematically. So now we're going to take a closer look at the Aliatari quilt and we'll be right back. All right. Well, now we're going to talk about organizing for process. And I have to admit, this this is a topic that Pam wrote, put in our spreadsheet. And I went, didn't we already talk about this? But then I thought, no, we didn't. And I'm glad you put this on here because I want I want you to give us all your wisdom on it. So this came about because... When I'm stuck in my car on my commute for my day job, (laughs) things in my brain start to collide together. And so my day job's in cybersecurity. And we talk about data security in a certain way. Because, like, when there's a data breach, sometimes it's, oh, someone hacked a database and stole the thing. Or it's like, oh, someone intercepted when the data was flowing from one place to another. So we talk about protecting data at rest and data in motion. Right. And I started to think about fabric in the same way, and that 
Fabric at Rest is like your classic, like how to organize your stash, how to, you know, have pretty mason jars full of fabric scraps. And, and a lot of those tips, which are great and beautiful, but not necessarily functional. And how do we how do we get better at organizing ourselves for when the fabric is in motion, for when we're in, in, in the middle of making a thing, whether we're cutting or sewing or all of that. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it comes down to workspace orientation. And there's a lot of principles from architecture that play in here. So in kitchen design, there's this idea of the golden triangle. And so it's the how the three big appliances in the kitchen are located between stove, sink, and refrigerator. And, you know, you throw in like a food processor and all that. But like or those big three ones. Yeah. yeah. But those big three are like. Yeah. Those are the places you store prep food. Yes. And you have to like commit to like plumbing and electrical decisions when you're building a house for those. So you right. like have to get those right. And you don't want them so close together that you're on top of each other and someone can't be like at the sink while someone else is at the stove. So you need enough space, but not too much space that, that now you're, you're always, like traversing. You can't reach really quickly <laughs> right. and get stuff. Yes. That, I mean, and when you think about cooking in your kitchen, that perfectly makes sense because I remember having, living in an apartment and having a galley kitchen and that was so frustrating because. Because you're either turning around or like reaching way it, far away. Oh, it wasn't, it just wasn't as easy. It, my kitchen now has a great triangle and it works, it works well. What I think helps with me, though, my stovetop and my ovens are separate. So mm-hmm. I think that helps yes, it does. in the process. But I like what you're talking about because you do have big appliances in the sewing world. Sewing machine, cutting, cutting table, table, ironing board. Yep, that's the three pieces of the golden triangle here. Now, so <laughs> because we're not necessarily like building our uh, house around our sewing room. We sometimes, can move them easily. Well, in general, yes. Or extension cords and all that lets you do that. But, you know, sometimes you're limited to, like, a very small space. And you're right. Like, oh, well, It's a bedroom, usually. I mean, or I think some, most people... like a closet there. or, like, yeah. a, a, I have to put stuff out on the dining table. So there's, there's different ways to, like, kind of get things set up, even if it's in a temporary location, too. Like, oh, well, we had to eat, so I had to put everything away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we could eat at the dining table. Um yeah, and I think a lot of people do that, and yeah. and we've all started there. My first sewing room was in a closet. You open the doors to the closet, the sewing table was there with the sewing machine, and you close the door to the closet. So I had to take or put the ironing and cutting board up and down every time I wanted yeah. to. So, yeah, I mean, I totally get it. Now I have a much more usable space now but yeah mine was on a dining table and like my sewing machine lived in the bottom of my closet and i would like pull it out and you know yeah so we've all been there honestly it was actually on my dorm desk at first because i was given a sewing machine when i graduated high school and i took that with me to college and it was real weird i was like the only one with a sewing machine in the dorm my first surprisingly my first sewing machine was my great grandmother's which sounds super old but she had an electric sewing machine and it was in a cabinet. My father gave it to me. And the cabinet's about this big. And the table goes up. Mm-hmm. And then you pull the yep. sewing machine out and it sits there. So you had this. Well, the table went this way. because So you had this space. and you're, So that was my first sewing machine. And I, I, I know more today than I did then. But I hated that machine because I could never get the tension right. Mm. And I didn't know enough on how to mess with that. Like, I think now I could, I still have it. I don't use it, but I could go and use that and it'd be yeah. fine. Okay. So, organizing for process. Right. So it's, Sorry, we you, get sidetracked. Know, we get sidetracked. So, the first thing in the process is typically like, oh, I have to pull fabric. And there's tons of tips out there about how to organize fabric. So oh, right. Yeah. To touch on that. But yeah. from there, you like kind of move into, depending on how you've stored your fabric, you may need to press it before you cut it. Yeah. Or if you're like me, you're just like, eh, it'll be fine. You just kind of <laughs> smooth it out with your hands. <laughs> Can't say that I don't do that. Um, Depends on the what I'm cutting for. If I'm cutting for precision, I'll iron it. Yeah. But if I'm just, I need a scrap of this, no, I'm not yeah, ironing Yeah, like it. if I'm just powering I may use these scissors to get the chunk. <laughs> That's all. Because I do applique and stuff like that, so I don't yeah. necessarily need to precision cut. So, so then it's about, is the stuff at your cutting table accessible and organized in a way that you can reach it easily? 
Good point. So you should have like one spot nearby where you've got your rotary cutter, you've got your rulers there nearby. Um, occasionally I need like a pin, like a flat head pin. Right. No, I agree. I'm with you. Anything else that you have nearby when you're um, cutting? Pencil or a marker that, I, that disappears. I do. Like if I'm cutting that's the same space that I'm going to mark a line to so trying to have square triangles or I'm just trying to think I have my rulers my scissors big scissors not little snips little yeah, snips like are close to my sewing shears machine. for me yeah. right and rotary cutters and those are like I have a basket of rotary cutters a basket of scissors and then my rulers are stacked up against mm -hmm. the wall on the top of my cutting table and you're right, like a pen, a little straight pen, or a, a pencil or some kind yeah. of marker that if I need to mark any kind of line. I find a dry erase marker to be handy to have there too, because occasionally if I'm screwing up blocks and I know I need to center it on a certain thing, I will put a dot of dry erase marker on, on my ruler. ruler. Yeah. So I know like line this up with center points or whatever. Or the edge, the corner so that I'm trim. Right. I know. So I don't I'm, have to go back and think about it. I'm like, oh, the red line on this ruler. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Dry erase. That's a good tip. Yep. Right. And this is the only thing I wrote down in this is everything has its place. Yes. Put it back. Because if you don't put it back and I'm, I, this is do as I say, not as I do tip. Because there are times where. I'm working on stuff. I'm like, where are those scissors? <laughs> I just had them. You know, if you just try to always put the scissors or always put the rotary cutter back into, then they don't get lost on your so on your cutting table. Yeah. I will say my space is better laid out for a right-handed person than a left-handed person. <laughs> you should change that, left-handed person. But I can't, and here's why. Oh, okay. So we took, I had the luxury of space, and so we bought, like, two kitchen cabinets from the local big box home repairs, home, you know, improvement store. And so I, I have like this nice large four foot by eight foot mm -hmm. space. Yeah, and so it's I, nice. So when I stand at the cutting table on this side, I have a big pressing surface that's like right next to my sewing table where my machine and stuff is. Um, and then I have the big giant mat and then like up there where I can't reach because like I don't have a four foot reach. I just don't. I don't um, so it's like project boxes of like stuff that I'm working on or, you know, whatever. But because I sometimes have to like push, extend my fabric over into the cutting table, you know, if I'm like cutting a long board or something, mm -hmm. I can't have like my basket of rotary cutters and all that here. So they're down at this end. So I do have to occasionally like reach over and grab stuff. Right. But I also like went and found plastic cup holders and we just like drilled out big circles and I have inset cup holders oh, so they won't nice. tip over which is nice <laughs> that is nice yeah <laughs> mine are up against yeah like the wall so they don't tip because of that um I do think that for me and I want to ask you about your ironing station too but for me because I have a table that extends in the room so I can walk around three sides of it to change where I'm cutting. And that's helpful when you have big, yeah. like if you're trimming up a quilt or whatever. So I can cut from any three sides because my cutting mat covers the entire table. I cut from one side. And that's very helpful. That helps in the process of... And so that's nice. Now, here's my ironing question. So your I so you're sewing and your ironing board's right here. Do you have to stand up to iron? Yes, I do. Okay, I do. Now I do have like the thing that you and I will take to class yeah. that it's like an ironing board extension that clamps on my sewing table. I will occasionally set that up if I'm doing little paper piecing or something where yeah. it's a lot of back and forth. Yeah. Um, but it's rare that I do that just because I don't want to get. Where I'm just sitting down all the time. It's better for your body if you, like, stand up in your... That's... What, I'm so glad you said that, because that's what I was going to say. I'm like, you do not want your ironing station. Because if it's right here, and you're doing this repetitively, I'm telling you, back you're going to get back sore. You, you will. Even in a swivel chair. Yeah. Like, you're going to forget to fully swivel your legs under where right. the ironing yep. station is. Yep. Because I went... Because we've taken those clamp things and gone to a retreat. And so for three days, I'm ironing in this and ironing in this. And I even bring a swivel chair with me. And my back was sore. Was so yeah. sore. And it was just because of that repetitive motion. 
I even in my own sewing room. Now it's two steps away from where I so where my sewing machine is, but I do stand up and walk over to yeah. the iron. Well, in part because you know my sewing table is at this height. Because my cutting and pressing table is at counter height, it's yes. taller, and so yeah, I would be doing too. this, which is not right. good either. Mine is too. So I I do think it's good for you to stand up, walk over there. Iron. Now that assumes you don't have mobility issues. Or, oh, true, you know, true, so, true, true. Yeah, very good. Yeah. You know. So do what's best for you, but I, you know, for me, it's better if I. Plus, my watch likes it. It goes, "Hey, yay, you stood up." <laughs> So let's thinking of fabric in motion in the transport from cutting, like right. so you've cut your pieces, right? And now you need to get them to your sewing machine in an order that is not a crazy pile of stuff. Like I know what your tip is, and I love it. Like what? But like, what do you do to get? So you've cut like, oh, I know, I need to match like these parts of the flying geese. Like are you just like grabbing them and like. <laughs> no, I don't. Um, so I have one of those portable swivel cutting mats, cutting mats, mm -hmm. and so I stack them on that, and it's small enough that it sits on the table next to my yeah sewing machine, so it allows me to keep things in order and to move it where it won't, you know, fly off or whatever. Because those cutting mats kind of hold the fabric a little bit because of how yeah. they are, um, and I don't have. I don't have cats that come through and go, <laughs> you know. So we're good there. But that how, that's how I move yeah. them. But I do like your tip because I think I know. No, that's my That's exactly what I do. What are you thinking of? You were talking about, and maybe you forgot you told this. You were talking about how you were moving units with paper plates. Oh, yeah. I've done that mostly at retreats, not necessarily in my own sewing room. But that's a, I think that's a great idea because if you want to keep, like, very important if you are doing a intricate laid out quilt where like it's a rainbow or ombre effect and you can't mix up the units into a different block and you want to keep all that block units together. I think that's a perfect tip yeah. of the just get a stack of paper plates and put each block on a paper and then those lift up easily together. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't done a ton of quilts like that. Mm -hmm. Usually when I'm doing that, it's like, oh, I want to work on a single project. I know it's going to take a ton of time. So that's what I take for retreat. Right. At home, I just use like usually a 12-inch cutting mat. Right. Um, but I like that little portable. And you yeah. can get those at any you know, kind of big store. Yeah, our big box store. The plates um, I was thinking of, not the cutting mat. Well, the cutting mat you can yeah. get at those big box stores too. Yeah. Um, so, and have coupons for those because they always put that stuff on sale. Here's my other tip. Okay, so we're talking about cutting to sewing. So now we've gotten it to the sewing and so now we have to get from sewing probably to pressing. Like, right. You know, yeah. you're probably going to want to press it. You're going to stand up and walk if you can. Yeah. How are you getting it from sewing to pressing? Um, I, well, I chain piece a ton, so it's already kind of in a little chain. <laughs> uh, but I cut it, I cut, I know you don't do this. I cut the threads at the it sewing on machine. It depends what I'm doing. It depends on my the, little, the way that I have to press. I have a stand that's got a, a blade. and I Yeah, I have that, that too. I love those things. So if I'm doing four patches where I'm spinning the seam, I just go ahead and snip all those apart using uh, the thread cutter right. and then just, you know, have a stack and take it over to the pressing table. Right. If I'm doing like flying geese where I've got, you know, they're all connected and they all need to be pressed the same way. Like I'm just flipping the wing open and pressing that. Those mm -hmm. I'll take like as one chain over there. Right. And then I still keep things like after I press, because I don't want to go back and recount like 200 things every time. I keep them in like a stack of 10 or a stack of 20. Right. Yeah. And that way I know like, oh, there's, you know, three stacks of 10. I've got 30. I've got 90 more to go. When I cut, that's interesting. I don't stack when, but you do a lot of repetitive blocks that you keep track of that stuff. I count when I'm cutting and I put them in stacks of 10. And then so I'll organize it like this is 10. And then the stack's 20. I do that as well. That's what I do when I'm cutting to know. Because I try to cut everything I need to cut first. 
which is good because if I ran out of fabric, that's the time where I have to, you know. Phone look, a friend. F- or look at my stash and, you know, solve the problem. <laughs> Say this is a design element now. I do that too, but I have found that like at least once in every quilt where I've done that, the math has gone funny. A cat's run by and like All right. a piece is like flipped from wind from one stack to another. So uh, I continually count. But I do, I do when I'm organizing, yeah. like this is 10, then turn right. this 10. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I do with that. So, all right. So you've pressed them. Okay. Got, you got some units. Now you're just, you're making some blocks. So you're going back to sewing. And so you're just repeating that process? Yeah, basically. Yeah. Here's my only tip on that is once you get something organized, do your best to keep it. Yeah. To the point that, like, for a scrap quilt like Bonnie Hunter's, when I get, like, here's my stack of, you know, 20 flying geese that are good to go, I don't just set it on my cutting table because I know I might have to move that to get to use the cutting table later on. So I have, like, kind of a big shallow bin. And then I put the stacks of the units in there. So then I can move the bin easily. I don't have to, like, move 13 piles of four patches later on. I tend to keep any project that I'm working on in those 12 by 12 scrapbook boxes. And I like the clear ones. They're, like, four inches deep, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I like the clear ones because... I can see, I can look in it and go, oh, yeah, that's this project. Because, unfortunately, I my brain doesn't work like Pam's does, and I don't just do one project end-to-end. I will do multiple projects with multiple starts and stops, which can be frustrating if you don't kind of have that a little bit of organization. I think, as a creative brain, if you don't have a little bit of organization, you can you can repeat a lot of steps that are unnecessary, and I think just gleaning some tips on how our brain works or my brain works, um, the biggest tip is once somebody has helped you or once you've got something organized, keep it. Keep it. Um, I do clean off my cutting table on a regular basis. Like when I'm done with a project or I'm done with working on whatever step I'm working on of that project, I want that clean so that I can start off before I get. I try not to pull out multiple projects at the same time. Yeah. Not to say I don't, but. Well, because especially if you like to work in a particular color and all your projects are like in that same color, yeah. right? Then your stuff starts to intermingle project to project. And you're like, What's why do I have four for? patches yeah. here? This quilt doesn't need. And then you just, yeah. I don't. And you throw them. And you're like, what's that for? That's no bueno. Yeah. No. <laughs> no bueno. <laughs> So I find that I, if I, like, try to keep my cutting table clean, um, then it then it's easier for me to not backtrack and have to redo steps for create. And I, I believe me, I know this is the hard part to be creative. It yeah. it is like I don't accept process as well as she does. Um, I appreciate it, but and and I think one of the big lies that creatives try to tell themselves is that process stifles my creativity. And that's not true. It's really not. Um, You can be creative and have a clean work environment. (laughs) You don't, you know what I mean? You don't have to be. And, and I think that's a, that's something I had to get over like, but I like my mess. I do like my mess, but I have found that I'm more productive if I have, once I get something organized and I keep it organized, it's so, it's so helpful. Mm -hmm. Just, yeah. Like once I got my stash organized, oh my gosh, I use my stash all the time. And what I found is I used to just stuff scraps into one bin. Mm -hmm. And you know, I just redid my sewing room and I bought all these different bins and it took up a huge amount of space on my new shelves. And I was like, I don't know if I'm going to keep this. But I sorted all my scraps into different colors. You would not believe how much I use my scraps now. And I'm not even pulling from my stash as I'm using these scraps. Yeah. And feeling so much more 
Um, like, oh, I need yellow? Cool. I don't oh, have to dig through a giant barrel to right. find it's yellow. Right. It's this one bin, and I pull it out, and there's this yellow, and I dig through that and find which one I'm looking for, and it's great. Yeah. So, And yeah. it doesn't have to—I think you've got, like, nine-inch bins? Yeah. Yeah, nine, so, like, nine-inch cube. But you can make, like, six-inch ones. Right. Or, you know, it I just depends on— I had for six-inch. I know. Well, it depends on how much you have. But there's— um, Oh, I'm having a brain fart on what the name is. Um, but there's a lot of modern quilt books that talk about scrap organization because what I find really appealing about modern quilts is that they're using scraps in different ways and that because they're doing um, improv piecing, that they don't need like a three and a half inch square. They just need like a piece. Right. And so there's lots of cute patterns out there for like make color coded bins. And I did this for my fat quarters where I've got, I made a fabric bin out of purple fabric. And my purple and my pink fat quarters are in that bin. Well, what I think I'm going to do, because the nine-inch bins are really kind of big for what I want, but what I think I'm going to do is make some that are a little deeper mm -hmm. and not as wide. Yeah. You know, maybe make them six inches but nine inches deep and then nine inches tall, and then that'll cut down on the space I've I'm using. Yeah, and then you can break it down a little bit more if you need right. to, or just take up less room. If yeah, you don't need take, more colors. I'd, yeah. I'd like to take up less room, actually, because I want more fabric. But um, I have found that just getting that organized allowed me to use it more efficiently and go back and not discard that fabric and never look at yeah. it again. Yeah, so. and that's definitely like a fabric at rest organizing thing. Right, But yeah. it helps you then when you're in the middle of, oh, I want to make a scrappy quilt and I need, you know. Well, I've been doing all these mosaics lately. And so I was just like, I just need a little yellow here or yeah. I just need a little red here. And I don't want to go cut off a fat quarter that I want to use maybe later in a quilt that I would need a fat quarter of. And if I cut off a little chunk, mm. yeah, so... I I have found that I'm using that a lot. I've been using my scraps this past month a ton. I'm very proud of myself for using scraps. <laughs> so everything has, a, these are my two tips. Everything has its place. And once you get organized, keep it. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. And don't, when you're looking to organize your sewing room, don't just think about how great it looks on a shelf. Ex ex because yes. it's got to be usable and accessible. You know, the other thing is you may need duplicate items depending upon your process. What do you have duplicates of that you find most helpful? Um, scissors. Yeah. Scissors. Because, and I have two sewing machines. I have a long arm. I have more than two, but I have a long arm and my regular sewing machine. And I need scissors at my long arm mm -hmm. that's not close to my regular one. Right. So scissors, I think, are one of the main things that I duplicate. Pin cushions. Pin cushions. Like sometimes you need a pin cushion at your cutting table and a pin cushion at your sewing machine. Yeah. Um, and a pin cushion at your ironing board. I feel board. like one day when I'm a fancy lady, really? I'm going to get rid of like all my existing pins and buy all new pins. Because I have like this mis mishmash, and I have like some oh, ball head pins, and I'm like, I don't need those. I need flathead. My flathead ones are bent. And it, oh, I like yeah. <laughs> One day when I'm a fancy lady, I, you pull out a flathead <laughs> pin, and it's like, Wurr. yes, most of mine are like that. <laughs> I still use them. You just kind of figure out how to work. <laughs> oh, I didn't say I sewed them those oh, away. Yeah. I still use them. Bent. I still use them. I mean, unless they're like significantly bent, like I accidentally sewed it. <laughs> Uh, and it goes. It's ding. got a 90 degree corner. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've, Those go away. I'm not saying I've done that, but yeah. Good times. Good times. All right. So have you sized the day Oh God. Uh, with our quilt blocks? <laughs> you can leave a comment on the blog or the YouTube episode or in our Facebook group, What's Up Stitches, and let us know. And that's all we have for this episode. Today's show is made possible by QT Fabrics. I honestly thought you misspelled that. We'd like to thank <laughs> Big Pink Productions for helping produce the stitch. If you've enjoyed the show, please like, share, and subscribe. And don't forget to turn on notifications on YouTube. More info about our show as well as links to purchase fan gear, online classes, and quilt patterns can be found on our website, thestitchtvshow.com. Be sure to tune in next time for more Quilting Chat with Friends.